Hello again and welcome to the program. Ghana's daily minimum wage was increased by a city to seven Ghana cities. The 16.7% increase was agreed by the tripartite committee comprising government, labor, and private employers after week-long negotiations which concluded today, or rather uh, Tuesday. The base pay which will inform increases in public sector salaries was also increased by 13%. Percent. Now, let's have a conversation of what went into this with Alex Frimpong, who is CEO of the Ghana Employers Association. Uh, you're welcome to the program, Alex. Thank you, and thank you. Good morning to your listeners. Good morning. Alex, now, what do you know about what went into this decision by the Tripartite Committee? Well, um, I need to explain the procedure for uh, determining the national daily minimum wage. Because mm. um, we start the discussion by putting together a technical subcommittee of the capital committee to look at the various measures using the uh, basic economic indicators, rate of inflation, GDP, and all that, including the ability of an enterprise to. So after going through all these technical motions, some scenarios um, are recommended for uh, discussion at the general level. And then as a result of that, we went through the um, various negotiations and discussions. And then uh, we arrived at the university for as the national building mode for 20. Mm, I see. Now, for you as as uh, private employers, or even before we get to that, this a CD increase uh, by the analysis you gave us should be enough uh, for the Ghanaian worker at, at this point. You, you think it is? Well, um, if you look at it uh, just by the fact that it's from 60 degrees to 70 degrees and um, it's uh, quite on the lower side, you may not appreciate the point. Um, the method of the one is only an increasing week. Mm. That uh, no, that no employer should pay. So, um, in, in reality, in most enterprises, they are paying way, way above the national minimum wage. It is only um, an economic indicator mm. that, that which any employer and giving labor should not go to do that. And it is practiced by many countries who have signed onto the minimum wage convention. No. And is not alone in this matter. Mm, very well. Now let's talk about the private sector employer of which you're CEO of the association. Uh, usually when there is an increase in public sector pay like it is with the uh, base pay for public sector workers, uh, private sector workers tend to uh, demand for same or, or, or some sort of increase there. Now how is this uh, going to read into p public sector em employment and labor relations? Well, uh, let, let, me, let, let me make a correction here. Right, the go ahead. Wage is not for, the minimum wage is not for uh, private uh, sector as well. I, I said the base pay, yes. not the minimum yes, wage. No. Yeah, the, the base pay is different. The base pay is uh, in connection with only public sector employees on the single spine pay structure. So that is a different matter. So that is uh, a relationship between government and its employees. Which is what I said. So uh, l l yes. let's try and address the question. The, 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 the point I was making is the fact that usually when there is this sort of increase, I mean generally like you said, private sector enterprises uh, just uh, pay a lot more above this benchmark. And, and what I was asking was about the fact that government has also announced base pay increase for public sector workers. And usually it tells on private employees or, or private, uh, um, workers in, in the private sector. My question then is, you as employers, how are you looking into dealing with this? Well, uh, the various private enterprises have their basis for reviewing their terms and conditions of service, mm. including wages and salaries. So, whether you have a collective bargaining agreement and it expires in January, in February, March, or April, you can only talk about a, 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 a wage review mm. when that time is due. What government did by announcing the increase in the base pay is their. It's the time that they should review their uh, wages in a 
accordance with the agreement is organized labor. So the two are entirely different. Mm. Yes. And, and so your, your advice to workers in the private sector will be they should wait their turn? Yes. Each of, for instance, if you reviewed your, if you reviewed your salary in November mm. 2014, the next period that you can review your salary will be in November 2015. You cannot um, do that now because a new income has been announced, not so public sector based has been announced. That is not uh, the case. Usually, do based upon the, the, the rules and terms uh, agreed between the enterprise and its uh, workers. Mm, I see. But with the challenges that the private sector has faced this year, is the private sector capable of that? Sammy, please come again. I, I'm asking that with, with the challenges that the private sector has faced, it, it, as an employer's association, do, do you see yourself capable of increasing salaries and, and, and doing things better? Well, that is, the, that is the challenge that we have. There, there will be the need for business to really um, have balance the need for employee terms and conditions to be used as against the survival and growth of the business. For instance, Businesses are being um, saddled with the energy crisis. How can we ensure that the city supply is regular and reliable and affordable? That's a major challenge. Mm. How do we ensure that uh, counterfeit and illicit trade does not impact negatively on their business operations? The general macroeconomic environment is hitting hard at businesses. How do we ensure that the currency becomes stable? How do we ensure that inflation is kept at bay? And all these contending um, forces compound the problem for employers. And then we the need to, to balance to ensure that fine employees also um, sell their labor, their skills and talent every day to keep the fuels of the business running. So how to balance the two to ensure that how to balance the business to ensure that all these um, interests are satisfied and uh, remain the challenges. Normally, if you have a very effective quality bargaining machine, you should be able to resolve all these uh, uh, problems and come to an amicable settlement on how you can review the terms and conditions of service. So, so let's put all, all that you have said in one sentence. The Employers Association is undecided whether or not uh, a review could be easily done. Well, uh, the various enterprises have different ways of reviewing the terms and conditions of service. And for every employer, the factors are needed to come into play in determining the I, levels. I, I, Alex, the I, I know, I know that, yes. but I, yes. I, I believe as an association, you've had conversations yes. around this because then you are the Ghana Employers Association. Exactly what has been the conversation? Will it be easy for employers uh, to, to be able to do this, or it won't be easy because of ABC, which you have outlined already? But what is the main point? Yeah, the main point is that it is not easy at this time um, in, 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 in our economic situation in determining or reviewing terms and conditions of service. It is not going to be easy. Yes, that's one I concede that it is not going to be easy. Mm. But then the reality and how business are able to shoulder this responsibility and this talent would depend from uh, would, would be an enterprise based uh, issue that looking at their circumstances, they should be in the position to determine what should be the case. Great. Now let's come back to uh, the minimum wage. Perhaps we'll wrap up with that. And the fact that Trade Minister, uh, or rather, uh, Labor Relations Minister, uh, Haruna Idrisus made mention of the fact that sometimes within the, the private sector we have some employees being paid below the minimum wage and it, it, it's difficult to deal with it because then again nobody is checking and nobody is reporting. How is the Employers Association going to deal with this? Well, we normally advise uh, our members to ensure that they pay um, above the national daily minimum wage. Uh, in the unlikely event that a business is not able to pay 
the national day no there's a there's a process that you need to go through for an exemption and it's part of all order and we usually would advise that you you report um to the labor ministry and then we support them in working out um an exemption um uh, clause for them but it 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 it's it's quite challenging to to have an exemption because um of the rigorous um expectations of how all these um factors need to be put together to be, to be able to uh, to get an exemption it, it's, it's quite a big challenge mm. Yeah. Alex, we'll leave it here for now. I'm grateful, very grateful for your time. Alex Frimpon is uh, CEO for the Ghana Employers Association. Now let's talk to another group of persons who would uh, benefit from the rise in the daily minimum wage as well as the 13% increase in the uh, base pay for public sector workers. Ernest, Owusu, uh, or Ernesto Owusu, yeah, Ernesto Owusu is with the co co Coalition of Concerned Teachers. Ernesto, you're welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I have just been corrected. You don't have to uh, tell me. Ernesto Poku is your name. Sorry for that. Yeah, exactly. Ernesto Poku. Ernest, how does this news come to you? You get to have a minimum wage of seven cities. And uh, a base pay, which will be more important to you, 13% increase in, in, in uh, your base pay. All right. Thank you very much um, once again to you and your listeners, the viewers who are watching you. Um, yes, Greed yesterday, after a series of meetings, the Public Services Joint Standing Negotiation Committee agreed on... Um, uh, an upward adjustment of 13% base pay across board. The truth of the matter is that organized labor, of which, of course, the Coalition of Consent Teachers is a member, we tabled 25%. We want the government to give us 25% with the reason that last year, government pleaded with us to make some sacrifices and accept COLA uh, because the economy wasn't in sound for them and that uh, we agreed to take 10% COLA. Uh, uh, but we agreed on principle that the government projected inflation rate was 10%. But at the end of the year, we realized that the inflation rate has moved to 17%. Mm -hmm. And that means that workers were shortchanged by 7%. And that uh, this year, the uh, inflation rate, government projected inflation rate is 10%. And we do the calculation plus one or minus one. So if you take 11%, which is the inflation rate, plus the 7% last year, that would have given us 18%. And if you add it to the COLA, which was given to us last year, then possibly we should have taken around 28%. But we told government to give us 25% because uh, we are also trying to make some sacrifices. But government made it known to us that indeed, if you compare last year to this year, there has not been any dramatic change, and that we still have to continue the sacrifices. And so based on the negotiation and other things, we agreed on that 13%. It's an indication that even though the 13% is, is very paltry, it's very small, and it's not going to cushion workers in any way, but we have decided as workers to make some sacrifices. And I think that it's also the turn of politicians to also make some sacrifices. Why, I, why do I say so? Mm -hmm. In my opinion, if you've given us 13%, which of course you have given us 25%, and we have accepted it, then what I expect government to do is to make sure that they put some sound economic measures to make sure that the inflation doesn't go up and that um, um, government doesn't increase petroleum prices as petroleum prices has reduced at the world market, government wants to reduce it here. Again, we have to also look at CD dollar ratio. Other than that, it will be like you've given the thing to us with your right hand, and then you take it again with your left hand. If government doesn't put certain measures in place to check some of these indicators, uh, the 13% will be nothing to write home about. So we have indicated to government, and again, we accept that 13% on condition, on condition that uh, government will make sure 
that the issue of categories two and three allowances will start negotiation by April and start the implementation by June. And I think that they've agreed in principle that they are going to uh, abide by that. And we also have to, we've also indicated to government that government has uh, frozen what is called annual increment. Mm. And government has uh, agreed to defreeze the annual increment so mm. that workers can at least have something to cushion themselves looking at their current economic situation. But Ernest, you gave out a number of conditionalities to government, checking the CD dollar ratio, checking the rise of inflation. But you never cautioned the likes of you to be productive because then, at the end of the day, if the taxpayer's money is paid to you as your salary at the end of the month, we expect productivity. Productivity has been one of our biggest bane for the ballooning wage bill because we are not getting anything in return. I find it a bit shocking that it wasn't part of your submission. Well, I think I agree with you that indeed, if, if, if you are being paid, then the, your salary should also commensurate with productivity. And as teachers, I think we are doing what we can to make sure that at least we provide the services that we've all agreed to. But you see, uh, let me tell you one thing. As much as we've given government some conditions, it is because mm. government failed to give us what, what is due us. But then we have made some sacrifices. Again, if productivity can go up, then um, the necessary logistics that I need as a teacher should be given to me. Mm. Now, school has reopened. Teachers are in school. If we don't provide chalk, common chalk that I need as a teacher to do effective teaching and learning, and the chalks are not being provided, if you don't provide teaching and learning materials, if you don't but, provide uh, NS, notebooks, NS, how do I do effective teaching and learning? And as one at a time, you're, you're telling us uh, that at the begin of, beginning of this new academic uh, period, government hasn't provided you chalk. Where? Exactly. In which community? I, I am saying, I am saying that the whole of last year, as uh, the Ghana Education, Director General of Ghana Education Service, mm. it is sometimes really difficult for them to come out and tell you the difficulty that they are facing. Mm. And that is why I made a statement that I'm highly disappointed in the Minister of Education. And I keep saying that if the Minister is incompetent, then it is also... And, as, and as, uh, let's, let's not digress. Uh, we are not talking about the Minister of Education. We'll probably find another time to have that conversation. Let's stick with productivity of the public sector. You're saying that if the public sector should be productive, for instance, for, for the education sector, government should be able to provide you the necessary uh, logistics and materials you would need to be able to be that productive. Fair enough. Let's, let's not go uh, further than, than that. But you, you have been very expressive in your conditionalities. Did government give you any conditionalities in, this, in, in the meetings you have had as far as these negotiations were concerned? Oh, yes, of course. Um, at the end of the day, government expects workers to deliver. Mm. And that is why... Then I, then I, I want to believe, let's give government benefit of doubt, that government will provide you these things to be able to productive. Now, let's move to be able to be productive. Let's move away from that. With these conditionalities you have given government, it means that if government cannot slash the, the rise of inflation or the inflation, inflation fig, figure now and, and deal with the city dollar ratio to be able to, 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 to be stable enough for you and I to enjoy the use of our national currency, you would rise against government. But do you really think, let's be realistic, the times we live in now, do you really think that government could actually shoulder any more rise in worker salaries? Uh, no, not necessarily. You see, um, when I was speaking, I indicated to you that uh, what is due are the actual um, um, uh, base pay uh, increment that is due workers mm -hmm. should have been 25%. Mm -hmm. And we have made sacrifices by accepting 13%. And that is why I said that if we have made sacrifices by accepting 13%, then it is also incumbent on government to make sure that at least the economy is stabilized. So that the 13% will not become 2%. Uh, uh,
In any case, let's be very real here. Mm -hmm. and the, the whole thing is not 13%, it's about 30%. Why, why do you say that? The base pay is, is based on 2013 base pay. Mm -hmm. The increment is based on 2013 base pay. Because last year, government didn't increase salaries. Government gave us cola. And so the, the, what we accepted was that government should add the cola, which is 10% to our salaries. And then 2015, government agreed to give us 3%. So in the 3% plus what it gave us last year, 10%, that is making it 13%. So the 13% is based on 2013 base pay and not 2014 uh, cola. And so actually it's 3%. Let's, let's make that one clear to the general public. That is why I said that we as workers have decided to make some sacrifices. In any case, if you give me 3%, and, and you don't stabilize the economy, and inflation goes up to about 20%, indirectly, you have reduced my salary by 17%. And that is why we are saying that government should do everything possible to make sure that the economy is stabilized, so that at least the level that we have accepted, at least we'll be able to make some gains. But let me also uh, uh, say that the current Minister of Employment, mm. I must commend him for... for um, the, the, the way and manner he went about the whole negotiation. That is it one of the days I remember last year when we had to go for negotiation on base pay, uh, this base pay increment. Mm. It took us almost five to six months. The negotiation ended in May, but the government ended up giving us 10% cola. But I think that this year when we began the year, the minister said that he wanted to make sure that by the end of the month, January, we should be able to finish the negotiation. And I think that uh, organized labor that is being led by uh, Secretary General of TUC, of which, of course, myself, I'm part of it, mm. have also done well in making sure that at least we have concluded negotiations. And anyway. That, um, this best day is starting uh, at the end of uh, 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 February. Ernest, I wish you well, and I'm grateful for your time. Thank Ernest you. Topoku is with the Concern Coalition or Coalition of Concerned Teachers. Well, now, we are not done with this conversation. Uh, let's speak to someone, or let's hear from someone, rather, who can answer the question of, can government show that this brand new cost Mama Vyogusuabwaji had a conversation with Finance Minister Seth Tekwe on this. Take a listen. Announced that the daily minimum wage had gone up by some one Ghana cities, and this take immediate effect. Is government ready for this? Uh, yes, uh, government is, is, is ready. But when you talk about the minimum wage, it's not just government. Okay, let me make a, a distinction. The minimum wage applies to the economy as a whole. Government, as, and that includes private sector, government as an employer negotiates with the public sector workers, and that is the base pay. So the minimum wage which applies to the economy as a whole to private sector is at, has been increased, and that would have to be applied by everybody. There's equivalent of the minimum wage in the base pay, which went up as a result of the single spine, there was a misalignment between the two. So that has gone up by 13 percent, you know. But so in the case of the base pay and increments that will come arising from that, you know, calculation, government included a provision in the 20 in presenting the 2015, you know, budget to parliament. Yes. Okay. So this is a bill that, uh, for government's parts, they can confidently take up. Um, I think that one of the factors that was discussed, you know, um, at who will be useful in this respect. One of the decisions that was uh, reached at Ho during the forum was that negotiations should as far as possible be within budget constraint. And we are confident that the levels which we have negotiated would not lead to the huge budget overruns, you know, in wages, you know, which we have seen in the past, especially uh, since the implementation of the single spine began. There are ghost names on the payroll system. Uh, how would this affect? And I know that you're doing a lot of work to get these ghost names out of the system. How would it work uh, now that the base rate is up? 
Um, we have been doing the payroll reforms for a very long time, and in fact, past governments have tackled this issue of ghost, you know, ghost names. The first thing we are doing is to strengthen the electronic platform, you know, for calculating, you know, the the wages. But most of the issues that, uh, and that's the second point I'm about to make, most of the issues that are often attributed to the payroll are not accounting challenges. And uh, when somebody is recruited, transferred, promoted, when that person resigns or when that person retires, it is a human resource management issue. That is not the responsibility of the controller. What is done, the interface with the controller is that the information on the person's pay, the information on promotion, you know, the financial implications are given to the controller. Or when somebody goes on steady leave without pay, the controller has to be informed to delete the person's name. Or when somebody resigns, the controller has to be informed. This itself has not been efficient. So we are working with Public Services Commission, Office of Head of Civil Service, Ghana Education Service, and all the services to build an electronic human resource management data base to complement the payroll. That is one of the major differences in the reforms that we are doing now uh, in relation to the past. In the past, when everything was manual uh, or partially electronic, we used to have the establishment secretariat where all these records were kept. Now it has been decentralized. So through the power of technology, we will be able to have that information so that once somebody is recruited, the information will be entered on the uh, human resource database. And through the interface with the payroll, the controller will get the information promptly. This is what will lead to narrowing down the long delay in paying particularly, it's not just ghost names, but um, difficulties like uh, a teacher or a nurse saying, I have been recruited, I have taught for six months, and I have not got my pay. It's because the paperwork, in many cases, is still you know, going. If you move electronic, and the same application form can be processed, or recruitment letters, and can be processed electronically, that information can go, the money aspect can go quickly, and we would hope that. So these are some of the changes you know, which we are making. I've heard some professionals argue that uh, you're relying too much on electronics, you're relying too much on softwares. Uh, if the human bits is not phased out, that could help. I don't know if you've heard about that argument. Well, I have, but sometimes uh, I would also, you said experts, I would urge those experts to talk, you know, because we have an internal audit agency for government. The purpose of that whole agency of auditors is on a day-to-day -day basis, check what is going on within government accounting, procurement, payroll, and other systems. That's their job. So it's also not entirely true, you know, that we are relying mainly on only you know electronics however as you put electronic systems in place you must equip those auditors to audit the electronic systems because when they come if you give them a paper as in the past they may check but somebody may be fraudulent electronically so they must also have it expert support to move and this is what we thought even government we are mindful because even the mighty u.s pentagon and others the hackers are able to go into their systems and that is a threat so we are mindful of that we also do things like biometric or of course electronic but you also do things like headcount you know where you can send the payroll information and make sure that everybody on that payroll so we we are not using only you know, electronic uh, means, yeah. All right, so news is out today about the National Service Secretariat successfully uh, being able to take some names that shouldn't have been on their payroll uh, out. That will be good news, but what lessons are you learning from that? Um, again, there's an accounting element and there is other policy elements. 
one of the policies which have been stopped, which didn't come in the news, is the voluntary national service, where many of these were exploited. The compulsory one, you would know, because somebody has finished school, the school can provide the information. If it is voluntary, there is no such database, information flowing from Ghana Education Service to say A or B has finished school. So what has been done is a suspension of also the, that's one of the lessons, suspension of the voluntary schemes, you know, has been suspended in order that we can have a very solid means. If somebody wants to do national service voluntarily, you know, you must be able to verify the person's background. This is the one that was exploited mainly. Did you play, did you play any role? Um, it was the office of head, uh, the office of the president, uh, based on information, BNI and others. Yes, but we did uh, complement that for the controller. And one of the things we are doing is uh, the National Service Secretariat is collaborating with the controller. So, for example, they are going to be paid electronically. No longer cash will be sent to be, you know, they are not on the payroll. But ultimately, we may build a supplementary payroll, you know, for that, in order that that can also be monitored well. So we are indeed, yes, playing, you know, a role in it. I, I rudely interrupted, but... We'll bring you more of that in our subsequent broadcast. But yes, government says that it has made enough provisions to be able to shoulder the new minimum wage and base pay or more importantly or more directly the 13 percent increase in public sector salaries now uh, let's find out what uh, analysts think about this dr godfrey a bokpin is with the university of ghana business school he's joined me over the telephone doc you're welcome to the program yes good morning and good, good morning, morning to your team very well. Now, government says it has the ability, it's made provisions to be able to uh, pay the, the new base uh, salary. From where you sit, what do you see? Yeah, I think that um, the, there is some uh, provision for that in the 2015 budget. Mm. And uh, certainly one would expect that government would have factored that into the 2015 budget. But budgets are based on assumptions. So the assumptions underlining those estimates and projections uh, get relaxed or are no more relevant in the cost of the budget life, then it means that all those projections there are a little bit more like a literature. Okay, but, uh, at the beginning or before the, uh, the 2015 budget, what oil price was at a certain point. Now we know where it is now. And where it is now is going to affect the government uh, revenue, or it's going to affect our revenue mm. envelope, which invariably would affect the ability of government to honor its uh, 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 obligations in the, in the form of payment. Okay. So there are a number of ways that government can do that. The government continues to pursue the necessary uh, reforms or improvement in terms of public sector financial management systems with the elimination of ghost names and ensure that this thing is a sustained across the, the various sectors, then savings from there will compensate for the shortfall that will come from other areas that we don't have control over. What is also important is that um, when you increase the minimum wage, as we have seen it, that should motivate workers to give up their best. Mm. But workers giving up their best does not only depend on just the salary or the minimum wage or the 13% increment, there are a number of other factors. How long does it take the worker to get to the workplace? What is the level of monitoring? See, what we have done with the single spine has focused more on what the, the worker gets in terms of the salary. What the worker gives in return for that, we have been a little relaxed in that. And the employer must do everything necessary to ensure that there is corresponding productivity to match with the increase in the salary. Otherwise, the inflationary pressures of that injection cannot be unexpected. Mm. It's something that can happen. So what do we expect? We expect that workers would do work. And when there is minimum wage or the wage also goes up, we expect that people will encourage to save a little bit more. And that will also narrow the savings investment gap in the economy. When, the, when, the, when wages also go up, as we have seen it, we expect that consumption will also go up mm. and motivate businesses to spend a little bit more 
in anticipation of increased consumption, that should improve the overall economy. All these benefits are only can only be realized if government is able to enforce the minimum wage. The joy does not lie in increasing the minimum wage by one Ghana city. Mm. The joy actually lies in the enforcement of it. Because our economy is predominantly informal, uh, it's based in the informal. You know, the informal sector is very, very large. And once that is the case, if government is unable to enforce the minimum wage that they have set, then, then it doesn't really benefit us that much. If, that, if government is able to do that, that should be able to also narrow the income inequality gap mm. and reduce poverty in our household. Mm. But I'm afraid. In the time past, we haven't been successful in enforcing it, especially in the informal sector. And <laughs> once we cannot do that, we cannot realize the intended benefit from that. And also realize that the public sector overall monitoring and evaluation is not so critical. Mm. You know at multi-TV and multimedia how you do your thing. You can't go to work and go and play Ludo. You can't go to work and go and do I mean, some other kind of things. There's monitoring, there's evaluation, there's reporting. To what extent can we carry some of these things to the public sector so that there is increased productivity to match the increase in the wage bill? But the wage bill is not only for the living. How well have we done in eliminating ghost means? There are people who don't work. They wake up once in a month to come and take salary and go back to the Senate. Mm. They are called ghosts, as though to suggest it's better to be on the other side. No. But we have to do what and clean up the wage bill mm. so that we'll be able to say that, okay, these are the people getting the wages. Are they giving up their best? Mm. Let's look at this 13% itself, yeah. the base pay increase. Mm. Is it realistic for a government like ours in a very peculiar period in its life? <laughs> is it real? You ask whether it's realistic. Is, is, is it realistic? Can the government shoulder this can can the government be able to pay this 13 percent without labor agitations in the future without uh, some sort of rollback effect on the rest of the economy because then as a country we have a ballooning wage bill to deal with mm. is it realistic you know there's the politics of it where from the one government tells you everything is under control then at the end they tell you oh the wage bill is out of control you remember in 2012, in the run up to the 2012 election, the wage bill was a blessing. Mm. We were all talking about the single spine and how it has increased the, the salary and all of that, and the, and the, and the excess liquidity of that, of that affecting uh, the, uh, having impact on the, uh, uh, the foreign exchange market. As soon after the election, it was a case. So what we have to look at is that, you see, you are also looking at this increment in line with other developments in the economy mm. Mm. in terms of inflation, okay? At the end, you want to be able to compensate workers for the time value of money because increases in the general prices of goods and services negatively impact the, the purchasing power of the, of, of the consumer or the worker. They want to be able to protect this purchasing power. By so doing, you, you, you would increase it maybe up to a certain point. And even that way, if you ask me realistically, 13% really is not something that adequately compensates workers, given the increased risk in, in the economy and other development in the economy. Mm. You understand that with all reliable power supply, water supply, people are, are, are spending extra money to be able to ensure that they, have, they are able to maintain their basic comfort and go to work and, and maybe come back from work and ensure that there's some kind of comfort. So there's increased expenditure for which workers would want to be compensated for those um, uh, uh, outflows. Okay? But you also have to look at it in the context of what is it that government can afford. Mm. The ultimate employer is the economy. If the economy is not doing well, yes, you can have a great deal of social and so. What will happen ultimately is that instead of government going to invest, they would rather go to fund consumption by paying a, a salary. And the long run effect of that will be very will be very hard for all of us to, to have to endure. Mm. Which way do we expect inflation to go? Uh, with the logic you have given, the fact that this 13% may not exactly be compensating enough to the public sector worker, and, and, and the fact that this could also, again, put, increase the purchasing, purchasing power of the public sector worker. 
How are we expecting this to tell on inflation? Yes, if there isn't a corresponding increase in production, goods and services, then we expect that there will be an upward pressure on inflation. And that in itself would mean that inflation perhaps will remain elevated at the end of the year, or mm. government might not be able to uh, keep uh, uh, or meet its inflation target. Okay. And once that happens, in the subsequent years, the employer, uh, the employee will refer government to what happened in the previous year in terms of what you said you're going to achieve in terms of inflation and what actually turned out. Okay. So that is there. So what we have to do, and that does not depend only on government. Mm. Individuals, all of us have a role to play here in ensuring that we go to work and do that which is expected of us. Even if nobody is watching at the end of the day, God is watching. The economy will suffer if we don't do that which we are supposed to do. We all have a role to play, but government has a greater role to play in ensuring that there is corresponding increase in productivity. Otherwise, we cannot operate in my past inflation period. Mm. It's, it's very obvious. Yeah. Bottom line. Uh, for me is that in spite of the fact that government may be working in removing ghost names from its payroll, uh, the wage bill will go up because then we have increased base pay for yeah. the public sector yeah. worker. Now, yeah. we, we also recall that this wage bill was, uh, was very much considered. It, it was center of uh, attention. It, 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 was, it was center of the discussion for IMF bailouts. Now, where does this leave us? Because we have just gone up on it. <laughs> that is expected. Once inflation is not going to remain the same or practice will not remain the same, you want to be able to compensate with it. That's the reality. When you have done that, there are other things you have to also do. And we have to focus more on doing those other things. Rather than more focusing on the fact that, yes, we have increased salaries, what is it that you can do, especially from the side of government and all of us, to ensure that at the end of the day, there is increase in productivity? What well, if we are able to produce more? Look, right now, our debt to GDP ratio is about 60%. Mm. A good way to reduce it is to double output. Or if you increase the GDP or your output, you will be that lower your debt to GDP ratio. So we have to work hard and increase output output of goods and services mm. and once we do that inflation should remain low but if we don't do that when we bill increase because for a number of other players in the economic businesses it's an input cost and once the input cost goes up what will happen is that they will pass it on to the consumer and this will reflect in the cpi but if we are able to increase productivity then I think that there should be a moderating effect. But, but no, you see... that output volatility mm. has implications also for consumption, volatility, income inequality, and poverty reduction. Mm. At the end of the day, the solution lies in working hard. I, I, I agree. I, I, I want us to wrap up. I want us yes. to wrap up uh, on this one, just with this last question. The, sure. the thing with productivity is that governments then would have to be able to give labor those things that labor has asked for to be able yeah. to, pro to be productive. For instance, I had a conversation with uh, pr president of the Coalition of Consent Teachers who said, yes, we will be productive. In fact, we can be productive if government is able to provide us some of the very basic things we need in our classrooms to be able to be productive enough for, these, the, these, uh, for, 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 for the economy. Now, my question is, we don't know. I mean, as things stand, we have, we have precedents that government has not been able to, I, I mean, as per what Labour tells us, government has not been able to provide them those things to be able to be productive. So we can only assume that our wage bill would go up without a corresponding increase in, in productivity, hence revenue. Yes. And so then, yes. it, it, this again, like I was saying, will tell on whatever bailout we are asking for, for from the IMF. Uh, my question is really simple. Why does it leave us? <laughs> uh, to some extent, government has given an indication that negotiations have been completed, and I'm sure some way, somehow, this, in, this uh, increment would have been factored into. I would be, be surprised, actually, mm. and I would be surprised if the IMF uh, isn't aware of this, okay? But that's the reality of it. I said earlier mm. that 
So motivating workers does not depend only on salary. Great. The other tools of work. And, and, and you see, there are places where people take their salary, but conventions and other things that are needed to ensure that productivity is guaranteed don't come. Mm. So people go to where they don't do anything. Mm. With that one, you can't expect productivity. I mean, to, to go up. No, Doc, I'm, I'm afraid we'd have to end our conversation here, unfortunately. We'll probably uh, continue this in, in other broadcasts. But I'm very much grateful for your time. Dr. Gottfried Bockfin is with the University of Ghana Business School.